What I'd like to do is introduce you to your guest of honor. You're going to absolutely enjoy this person so much. Um, some of you may not be able to see his presentation. It's up here, so if you need to, you can shift over. There's extra seats at some of these other tables, including this table right up in front of me. I had the pleasure of interviewing this gentleman uh, a few weeks ago, and when it aired on the morning show, we had several callers call in and said, I've never heard someone so thorough in just 10 minutes explain why the Supreme Court decision against school choice was wrong. In, huh? Torah, the trial, thank you. To the trial court. And it really takes a talent to be able to talk about those things that we sometimes think might be complex and bring it down to help us understand it. And so this next person, the Honorable Jason Bedrick, is a policy analyst with Cato Center for Educational Freedom. Jason has extensive policy research experience, including detailed legislative development and analysis. He previously served as a legislator in the New Hampshire House of Representatives as a research and, a, and was a research fellow at the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy, where he focused on state education policy. Mr. Bedrick was distinguished in 2008 for public policy. I mean, for as NHLA Legislator of the Year. Jason received a Master's in Public Policy with a focus in Education Policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. His thesis, Choosing to Learn, assessed the scholarship credit programs operated in eight states, including their impact on student performance, fiscal impact, program design, and popularity. His talk tonight is entitled Education, Choice, and Transparency. Please give a nice big warm welcome to your guest speaker tonight, Jason Bedrick. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, can everybody hear me already? It's, it's, uh, it's absolutely an honor to be speaking to the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. Uh, the Liberty Alliance has a spot in my heart as I was, the, as you mentioned, the 2008 uh, Legislator of the Year of the Liberty Alliance. I can't think of an organization I would more happy, more honored to speak at. Uh, just to tell you a little something about the Liberty Alliance, for those of you I saw there were a lot of people who stood up earlier and said that uh, this was your first time here. Uh, there are only two organizations that have a paper that rank bills, that grade bills, that they hand out at the beginning of every single legislative session. One is a group of Republican conservative legislators known as the House Republican Alliance, and that's read by most of the Republican caucus. The other is the gold standard by the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, and that is the only outside group that ranks every single bill. There are other organizations that have their pet cause. They, they submit, uh, you know, they'll, they'll hand out placards about their particular cause. The Liberty Alliance is the only one that does it for every single bill. And people know that they're not, they're coming at it from a, um, they're coming at it from principle, not from partisanship. And so there's a lot of respect and I can tell you that it really does make a difference. Uh, so, I'll touch briefly at the beginning of my talk on uh, education choice in New Hampshire. Uh, as you know, we passed in 2012 uh, a scholarship tax credit program. That moves New Hampshire. New Hampshire is a very innovative bill. This bill was, did, did something that no other bill, no other uh, uh, program in the country has done, and that is, that is the first scholarship tax credit program to include homeschoolers. So, Uh, I had the distinction uh, of working on this bill with uh, many people in the room, um, Michelle Lavelle and, and Kate Baker at the NEO, the, the Network for Educational Opportunity, are here tonight. Uh, they're absolutely fantastic. It's a great organization. Uh, they're out there on the front lines right now. 
What makes that so different is it moves from school choice to educational choice. Previous voucher programs and scholarship tax credit programs have said that you know you have the choice of the public schools and now we're going to expand your options to go to private schools. This bill says there are many different types of ways that you can provide an education. It's not necessarily in a building that we call a school. And so it's moving us in the direction of educational choice and educational freedom, which is where the movement needs to go. There is a hitch though. The, I won't, I won't uh, dwell on this for too long. Uh, if you want, I, I wrote an article about this in the Concord Monitor recently. You can find it online uh, at the Cato Institute's website. There was a court decision at the trial court level, this is going to be appealed to the Supreme Court, where they said that this program, the money cannot go toward religious schools. They said it was a violation of the Constitution, the, anti, the uh, historically anti-Catholic Blaine Amendment, which says that money can't go to parochial schools. The hitch is that it doesn't use public money. The Blaine Amendment says public money can't go to private schools. This does not use public money. I was thinking about this the other night, I was, I was telling my, my girls, these are my girls, I was telling my girls a story uh, of the city of Helm. The city of Helm in Jewish folklore was a city full of idiots and fools. And, um, and of course, the most foolish of the fools who lived in the city were the city council. And there was, uh, there was a story that before a holiday where it was customary to have lots of sour cream, there was a shortage of sour cream. And so the city council was thinking, how can we solve this sour cream shortage? Well, we have an abundance of water. So all we need to do is we call sour cream water and we call water sour cream. Problem solved. And there, that's, what this, uh, that's what this decision reminds me of. There's a judge in this, uh, in this state who would make a perfect judge for the city of Helm. Because what he did is he said, I have a problem. Like, the, the organization that was suing the state because of the, the program, uh, the scholarship tax credit program, they went judge shopping. That's why it wasn't, in, uh, it wasn't in Merrimack County, it was in Stratford County. That's where the decision was handed down. They went judge shopping, and the judge said, I have a problem. In order to strike this down, it has to use public money. But you know, you have a private corporation that's donating to a private nonprofit scholarship organization that gives the money to private citizens who are parents, who gives the money to private schools. At no point in time does that money ever enter the public treasury. The tax collector does not collect it. And the US Supreme Court has said that if the tax collector does not get its hands on that money, it never becomes public money. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. So he said, well, what if we did this? Any money that the government would have collected maybe because they put a tax and then gave a credit is now public money. Even though it never entered the federal treasury, even though the tax collector never got his hands on it, that is now public money. That is now, what was, what was sour cream is now water. That is essentially what this judge did. It defies precedent. He spends 54 pages citing the dissent in the U.S. Supreme Court, the dissent in the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, he says, well, the decisions were very close. Uh, Grant Bossy from the Jaya Bartlett Center said, this isn't volleyball, you don't have to win by two. But that's, you know, he decides to do that. So it was against precedent and it was against logic. When you think about the logic, extending out the logic of, of, of this court decision, that means that, well, look at the, every single house of worship has a property tax exemption. And when I donate to a house of worship, I get uh, a charitable deduction on my federal taxes. So if that money is now redefined as public money, every single house of worship, every dollar flowing into every single house of worship and every single religious school is public money, wouldn't that violate the First Amendment's Establishment Clause if all the money that was going to all of these institutions was directly funding public money directly funding religious institutions every single dollar that they collect. That's the logic. And ultimately, and the Arizona Supreme Court said this, ultimately, it means that the government owns every dollar that you have. It's just a matter of how much they decide to let you keep. That is the danger in this trial court judge's decision. And so let us pray that the Supreme Court has more wisdom that uh, they didn't hire somebody from the city of Helen. Uh, to be the Supreme Court Justices in the state and that they will 
ultimately overturn it. But uh, moving on to the main presentation about uh, financial transparency, I want to start with the question, how much does it cost, on average, to educate a child in an American public school for one year? Think about that for a second. <laughs> to warehouse them for the year. <laughs> so, the Harvard, Harvard University Program in Education, Policy, and Governance has an annual survey. A few years ago, they asked this question, and the median answer was $2,000. I'm glad you're laughing, that means you're a smart audience, which was evident because you're here. The average answer was a little higher, $4,250 per child per year. Now, according to, if you were, you know, uh, some people that are maybe a little more intelligent, let's say that they read the New York Times, that's I mean, <laughs> they might read David Brooks's column where David Brooks cites the National Center for Education Statistics who says that it is $11,000 for the operating cost. The operating cost. Now, what is that? The operating cost is the day-to-day -day cost that excludes things like buildings or pensions. The total cost, $14,000 per year per child on average. What this shows you is a serious problem in our constitutional republic. The, one of the fundamental premises of self-government is that people are informed enough to make public policy decisions. Right now, we are failing at that. There's a huge gap between the perception of what we are spending on our public schools and the reality of what we are spending on government schools. Bonus question. Raise your hand if you have the answer, and you may win a Cato Declaration of Independence and Pocket Constitution. <laughs> How much does it cost on average to educate a child in a public school in New Hampshire for one year? $16,500. Over here, that was close enough. 16000 was close enough. It's 15800 according to the latest numbers. We'll pass this back to this gentleman in the green. $16,000. Now, this, this vast, vast underestimating of how much we're spending on public, on, on public education is despite an incredible increase in the amount we've been spending over the last 40 years. In 1970, to educate a child from kindergarten all the way through senior year of high school was almost $60,000. By 1990, it was over $100,000, and the latest figures in 2010, over $164,000. We're talking essentially a three-fold increase in the last 40 years. But if you look at test scores, Wow. We've tripled what we're spending. By the way, these are inflation-adjusted numbers. These are inflation-adjusted numbers. So we've tripled what we're spending, and what are we getting for it? Nothing more. Now that Harvard study I, I mentioned earlier asked another very interesting question, which was, do you think government funding for public schools in your district should increase, decrease, or stay about the same? Increase, decrease, or stay about the same? They divided their respondents into two groups in a randomized controlled trial. Half of them randomly, they asked just this question. No prompt whatsoever asked just this question. And it's hard to see here, but 63% said we should spend more on the public schools. 29 said stay the same, 9% said decrease. That's pretty much a supermajority to increase. Now, the second group, that was the uninformed group. The second group was the informed group. First they said, in your district, we are spending X dollars per pupil per year. So on average, about $14,000 per pupil per year for people around the country. Then they asked them this question. What was the answer? Much less. 43% said that they were in favor of increasing, which you'll notice is less than the majority. About a 20-point swing, a 20-point swing, when people knew what was actually being spent in their district. Now this has real-world consequences. I will take you through 
to the election 2012 in Colorado. This is from an NBC affiliate report. There were 38 ballot initiatives to increase spending in 31 districts. The total of the money that was going to be raised in, in, in these 31 districts would have been $1 billion. $1.03 billion to be precise, more precise. Sorry, it's a little dark here, but uh, this is Kathleen Gephardt. Kathleen Gephardt was a lawyer, an activist, uh, who would go on TV and she would argue in favor of increasing education spending. She was suing the state, they just lost this, but she was suing in a Claremont-style decision to say, the Constitution says you have to fund schools, you're not funding enough, so the, the judiciary should force the legislature to spend more than they would otherwise spend. That the, their uh, Supreme Court was wiser than our Supreme Court and declined to get involved, uh, but this was actually before that decision. She says, the, according to the Colorado Department of Education, the state pays about $6,500 per pupil. That's her claim, $6,500. They go over to Ben DeGroe. Ben DeGroe is uh, for the Independence Institute. They're sort of the Josiah Bartlett Center of uh, Colorado. He says, no, as a matter of fact, the state pays about $10,000 per pupil. Back to our friend, I don't know if there's a way to make it brighter, but back to our friend Kathleen Gephardt, who says, oh, $10,000 a year would be unimaginable for almost anybody in Colorado. It would be a nice problem to have, but it's not the one we currently have. So they say, well, look, one lady says it's $6,500 per pupil, that's $2,000 lower than the national average. She says, Colorado, we're in the top 10 for wealth and in the bottom 10 for spending. Or maybe it's closer to $10,000 per year, says some guy. We go to the reporter, who we expect now he's going to tell us, and he says, like any good political debate, much of the issue will be addressed at the polls. <laughs> this is not a political question. The political question would be, how much should we spend? Should we spend more? Should we spend less? Should we stay the same? This is an empirical question. This is a matter of fact. How much are we actually spending? And the truth is that they're asking the wrong question. They were asking how much is the state kicking in. The real question is how much are we spending in total when you total state, when you total state local, and federal sources of information, of, of funding. And the reality is over $12,000 in Colorado. About twice the figure that she cited from the Colorado Department of Education. So, what were the results of the election? Well, 34 out of 38 bond issues passed. In 29 out of 31 districts, totaling 1.01 out of $1.03 billion. And a billion here and a billion there, and soon that money starts to add up. Now, remember that question that Harvard asked earlier. On average, an informed voter is 20 percentage points less likely to support increasing funding. Well, 20 of the ballot initiatives pass with less than 60% of the vote. If those voters had been informed instead of misinformed by activists and media and to an extent their own government, more than likely, at least half of those ballot initiatives would not have passed by informed voters who knew what was going on in their district. Now, here's a second question. Nobody's going to get this. What do these 10 states have in common? They are all red. Okay. All 10 of these states are 49th out of 50 in per people spending. In one year. At least activists and media claim in all these different states to be uh, 49 out of 50, and some of them, quite a few of them, are actually sort of kind of telling the truth. Because it depends how you count. Take New Hampshire, for example. New Hampshire's per pupil spending rank in this last year. Well, if we ask the US Census, we're number 11. If we ask the National Center for Education Statistics, which is a government body, their total is uh, if you took total per people spending, we're number 12, but if you look at only operating, which again excludes those big budget items like buildings and pensions, we're 10. But if you look at the NEA, the union, we're actually number eight, but if you look at Education Week, which, uh, which, which uh, adjusts it for regional cost of living, then we're number 11. 
Now, there was another group in Colorado this year claiming to be 49. First of all, it's an old statistic from many, many years ago that they were 49, but they're going around with shirts that say, we are 49 out of 50 in spending, and they adjust for per capita income. So in other words, if you had a whole bunch of states and they were spending the exact same amount per pupil, the wealthier states would be lower on their rankings, not because of what they're doing in the school, but because they have more money. And there's this assumption that if we have more money, we need to continue to spend a certain fixed percentage of that money on schools, which is sort of crazy. Uh, and also, it is sort of besides the point, right? Because inputs, equal inputs do not imply equal outputs. Let's say you have two employees in your astrophysicist firm, and one of them is Al, and the other is Arnie, and yeah, they're both immigrants, they both have a similar accent, but they, one of them is not producing as much as the other. And so you say, well, Arnie is simply not producing. It must be because of a lack of resources. I am going to double his paycheck, and obviously he's going to double his output. Well, no, that's not right. So looking at all these different states and focusing only on this input, how much money we're spending, does not really tell you what the output is, how well children are learning. But there's this assumption that most people have, well, you get what you pay for, uh, so if we throw money at the problem, it's going, to be, it's going to be fixed. If that were true, the best schools in the country would be in, in Washington, D.C., where they spend almost more per uh, pupil than anywhere and yet have the absolute worst scores out of anybody. So this is what we are up against. For those who can't read it, it says, you've heard of lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, apparently they were lying about the damn statistics. We're up against state departments of education that report incomplete and misleading figures. We're up against state act activists who use those figures to mislead the public, and a media that is too lazy and too incompetent to uncover and report the truth. So we at the Cato Institute, next month, will be releasing my first report, Cracking the Books, How Well Do State Education Departments Report Public Spending? Public spending. <laughs> what we did is we analyzed the financial transparency of all 50 state departments of education so that you don't have to. We gave them an A through F grade for completeness, completeness, timeliness, and accessibility, and we'll be working with state-based think tanks like Josiah Barton Center here in town and watchdog groups to promote this nationwide. What we've uncovered, first, the first problem is misleading data. There are 24 states that only report operating, or what is usually called current per pupil expenditures, which leave out major items as said before, like capital expenditures, you know, buildings, pensions, and whatnot. Uh, there's also a lot of missing data. Eight states don't provide any capital expenditures. Twelve states are missing average employee salaries. Forty-one states are missing average employee benefits. Here are the top ten states. New Mexico, I don't know if that has anything to do with Gary Johnson. I haven't proven that that was because of him. Mexico comes in at number one with a score of 93%. It's an A. Uh, top 10, New Mexico, South Dakota, Washington, Nebraska, Texas, California, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, North Dakota. Notice, no clear red-blue state divide. We've got Texas and California, you know, New Mexico and New York, no clear red-blue state divide. In the bottom 10, again, all, all Fs, Massachusetts, the only correlation you can find is if you're not in the lower 48, you have a really bad financial transparency. Hawaii and Alaska came in dead last both an F- minus with a 28.25 and a 26.75. Now you can go to our report. Uh, it's a report on financial transparency, so it makes sense that we're very transparent. Anytime you do a ranking system like this, you could reweight it differently and the numbers will change a little bit. Uh, but what we did is we provided all the data so you could see most of it is very objective and it just shows do they have this, do they report this, or do they not report this, do they report this properly, or do they not report this properly. Uh, and you're able to see all that. Uh, so does anybody want to venture a guess what grade New Hampshire got? C. C, anybody? D. Can I, I hear a D? D minus? Who said D minus? Where is it? Right there, okay. You can come collect this. 
New Hampshire got a D minus. New Hampshire is in 27th place. 27th place. Now I will say, when it comes to state spending, if I were only to look at the state averages, New Hampshire does a pretty good job of actually reporting the data. The, the website is a pretty decent website. It was easy to find things. Uh, it's the district level data that is the problem. For the state, they will report total per pupil expenditures. For the district, they only report operating. You can only find operating per pupil expenditures at the state level. That's a problem. If I want to compare one district to another district, uh, if I'm looking at how much is being spent in my community, well, they just built that new high school in Manhattan. How much is that costing us? I have no idea. No data is provided at the district level for total expenditures, capital expenditures, total salaries, pensions. You can get a lot of that at the state level. You cannot get any of that at the district level. Uh, so with that, I thank you very much again. It's an honor for you to be here, and I'm willing to take uh, questions for as long as it happens. Okay, so welcome to follow us at Twitter. Uh, the Center for Educational Freedom at Cato is at Cato CDF. I'm at Jason Bedrick. Uh, and we had a question. Uh, again, when will that, that uh, be available? Uh, late August. I don't have an exact date. It'll be late August. It's a back to school special. Uh, other questions? I did such a. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, it's, being, it's political as opposed to economic. economic. Uh, I can't impute motives. I don't know. In some cases, I'm quite certain it's just incompetence. In other cases, it may be malevolence. Uh, and, and in, in a race between malevolence and uh, incompetence, I think incompetence usually wins. But I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say why they aren't doing what they're doing. Frankly, from my point of view, it doesn't matter why they're not reporting these figures. Uh, we have to shame them until they report them. Yes, right there. Uh, yes. The, uh, the grading system, uh, do you, are there details of what kind of roadblocks you run into? Like, for example, they just have the data and refuse to give it, which case would be malicious. So what we what we what we graded is only what is available on the State Department of Education website. If a citizen has to email or in some way contact the state to ask them for the data, they don't get any credit whatsoever. They need to provide that data proactively to citizens in order to get a good grade on our system. And again, we have a page that details at grade length uh, how exactly. We, we graded and how we weighted the system. The most weight that we give is to that figure I mentioned before, which I, I think is the crucial figure when you're comparing districts. If I know that one district is spending $5 million and one district is spending $10 million, I know absolutely nothing about those two districts unless I know how much money they're spending per pupil. Then I can actually compare them. So the, that, since per pupil is the most important figure, it's, a, it's the figure that's cited most often, uh, we gave the most weight to whether or not a state provides the total per people figure number or some partial figure. And Jeremy was next in the order. You answered my question. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, how do uh, comprehensive annual financial reports fit into this? Like, I know, like, City of Nashua, I think they have the per pupil on mm -hmm. that capper. Uh, but that's the city level, and you're looking for more. Yeah. Um, if I had an army of researchers, I would have looked at every single city. <laughs> but uh, with our staff, it was enough. Uh, it took us many, many months just to go through every single state, and we're only ranking at the state level. We do recommend, though, when we're going to be working with uh, state think tanks, that they take the model that we did and maybe do the top 10 cities in their state uh, and, and look at that as well. But uh, all we did is look at the state level. In the back. So there's not good data out there 
for the entire state. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Uh, it is much lower. If you go to the Josiah Bartlett website, it's josiahbartlett.org slash school choice week. Uh, it was a report, my master's thesis, that uh, the Josiah Bartlett Center published last year. The last appendix goes through the top 10 cities, and I collected the published tuition from every single private school. Uh, now, again, that number is high because the sticker price for tuition and what is actually paid for tuition are two very different things. But even just looking at the sticker price, knowing that they uh, will provide a lot of financial aid, even just looking at the sticker price, it is much less. And there were some schools that were even less than $2,500, which means that the average scholarship with the New Hampshire Scholarship Tax Credit Program that, again, uh, Kate Baker and Michelle Lavelle and others in this room are, are, are running, uh, would fully cover tuition at some of those schools, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, questions over on this side of the room, or maybe way in the back. Is there a, uh, yes, in the back there, and then you're next. I have a narrow technical question. How do you in your work uh, prefer to handle the total uh, pension expenses, basis, cash basis? Okay, so we didn't do any calculations whatsoever. We just graded if they reported them or not. And we didn't give preference to one form of reporting or another as long as it was uh, something that is, is customarily done. So we didn't, we didn't get to the granular level. There was, there was, there was one uh, group, I forget their name, uh, I know it's Professor Stephen Freeze in California. Who, they looked at California's and they had a 1,000 page paper going really down to the micro level. Uh, we couldn't do that for all 50 states. Uh, but. Uh, if, if some think tank, state think tanks want to do that, I think that would be fantastic. So this is sort of just, uh, this, this is a start. Yes? If you run numbers, uh, do you collect data on pupils in public education versus uh, pupils in general, or pupils in public private education? No, uh, I'm not quite sure you're asking. Oh no, we're just, this project is only financial transparency, so we didn't ask if they were reporting how many students are in the state or how many students are participating in some programs. Just uh, the, the money that you take away from us and spend somehow, we just want to know how you're spending it. Uh, and that's that's all we looked at in this report. Uh, in the back, way back in there, went once, twice, three times. Well, thank you very much, it was an honor and a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you.